basically I was, uh, my teacher was a bird man. So I was originally a bird man and I started watching pigeons. Now here's what I would see at night. There were four pigeons that roosted outside my bathroom window. I was on a third story of these three-decker apartments in North Cambridge. So I'm watching them and getting to know them. And I see that it's two couples and the two males sit on the inside. The two females sit on the outside. And I say to myself, now why is that? The males are the more aggressive sex, so you might think they would sit further away from each other. That would be a more peaceful arrangement. No. I don't want you near my female or my mate, and you feel the same way. So this is my female, and this is his female, okay? And that way, I'm between him and her, and from his standpoint, he's between uh, me and her, okay? So I say, very interesting. These people have some sexual hang-ups, you know, regarding what we would call extra pair copulations now. All right, one day, a lone male arrives around four o'clock in the evening, both of these males hit up and attack him. They keep attacking him. He finally gets to settle down when it's dark, way down the far end of the gutter. All right, fine. Next night he comes back, same thing. He barely moves an inch or two in from there, right? Because they're driving him away. Again, I say to myself, these males have sexual hangups. They're worried about a third male. He, he might walk off with my female, okay? Then, after about five days, he arrives with his female. Turns out he was mated all along. But the strategy apparently was, let's have the male go search for a good place for us to, to live. You know, she'll stay safe wherever they are. And then when he's got it, I don't know how he talks her into it, but they arrive together. That night, they cut the distance in half. They were halfway into the to the they, the four that they wanted to sit near. I'm not dead sure why they want to sit near each other. I think it's partly protection from the wind. It may be protection from the predators, but I think it's more the wind probably and, and staying warmer. In any case, so I say, oh, so since he's mated, now he's less of a threat, right? So I got to watching these pigeons and I got to see something that resembled the human double standard, you know? And I saw something extraordinary as follows. I'll just tell you two stories and I'll shut up on this, or maybe three. Okay, can't promise to do better. The first is, what happened when they finally got all the way in there? Now you got six birds. It's impossible to have each male between the two other males and his female. Geometrically, it cannot be done. What you ended up with was this. One female's on the outside. Her male is right next to her. Another female's on the outside. Her male is right next to her. The third male, and he may be the most dominant, is right in the center between these two males. But he's gone and pecked his female to force her to spend the night on a sloping roof. Just a few inches from him, but not next door, not rubbing her elbows with a male on the other side. So this gave the lie to the common fallacy at the time in ornithology that bird families were conflict-free units. You know, they're just working to rear the young together. They split up the work. He brings the food. She does this. They alternate sitting on the eggs, blah, blah, blah. No, you're forcing a cost on your mate, and these are tend to be monogamous for life. You're forcing a cost on her because she would prefer, and therefore we 
must assume it would be better for her to be sleeping down in a gutter. Uh, you're forcing a cost on her, which is going to harm you. Don't you read together? Let's say she starts the spring weighing 5% less because of this unfortunate position you put her in. That's 5% less resources for your children, right? Now, I was a late person then. I used to do my work late at night. So 2 o'clock at night, I hear, woo, 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 you know, the sort of fighting sound of pigeons, and I come out and I see what's happened. What happened is the female waits till her male falls asleep, and then she slips down where she wants to be, okay? And I don't know how long she gets to enjoy that. And then as soon as he wakes up, that's when the fight starts because he picks her back up there. So I say to myself, what's driving this system? Oh, I saw also that, you see, one sex spent the night on the eggs from 4 o'clock in the afternoon till 10 in the morning and the other from 10 to 4. And I must say I've forgotten which one. I think it's the male all night long, but it may be the other way around. Okay, but there's an overlap there. So one sex has now spent the night sitting on the eggs, but the other sex is taken over. So he now goes to the park. And in the park are some females that haven't yet taken on their job in the daytime. So what does he do? He courts them. I knew these guys, you know, by, by identification. So he's going around you know, flapping his wings and, you know, in front of the female, oriented always which way she's going, making some sounds that are supposedly going to be attractive and so on. By the way, I never saw a female fall for this act, but there's no doubt what he was trying to do. So once again, I say, this looks disturbingly like our own species. The male's got a double standard, right? He goes nuts at the thought of a, of a male even sleeping on one side of his female, but he's out hustling sex uh, when he gets the chance, right? So I say, what's the variable? What's the, what's the difference here? What's running this show? And I say, it has to be that one sexual act is trivial in cost to a male. Uh, a single sperm cell weighs about a, a trillionth of a gram, so that means a whole ejaculate doesn't even come up to a gram, you know, or so. It doesn't weigh nothing, doesn't cost nothing, so to speak. She's going to produce an egg, and she only produces two eggs at a time. It's costly, you know, and the investment to rear them is costly as well. Now, that's how far my thinking had got. When I was taking a reading course from Ernst Meyer, the famous evolutionist at Harvard, a German, by the way. I'm taking this genetics course from him, and I go in there one week, and I haven't done any genetics reading. So I decided I'll tell him pigeon stories instead. So I tell him a few pigeon stories. He says to me, have you read Bateman 48 in Heredity? I said, no. He said, that's got the solution to what you're talking about, or that's got the, you know, whatever. You gotta read that. So we chat on a little bit, and I leave his office. Now a few weeks roll by, and I still haven't done any genetics reading, so I have the gall to go in there and start telling him some more pigeon stories. He cuts me off. He leans forward. He says, have you yet read Bateman 48 in Heredity? I said, no, I haven't. He says, I will not talk to you anymore until you have. Oh, I've always loved him for that. You know, I was talking with someone earlier about hard teachers. Those are the ones you want. They'll teach you. They'll force you. So he says he won't talk to me anymore. I left his office with one burning desire to read Bateman 48 in Heredity. I'm bending over the odious Xerox machines of the time that emitted this green light, you know, and I'm pressing myself close to the machine in case it's mutagenic. I don't want any uh, 
abnormal children off of Bateman 48 and Heredity. And the scales fell from my eyes because Bateman 48 and Heredity had something that no one else had, and it was variance in reproductive success analyzed by sex. So it said, because in most species the male invests nothing and the female invests a lot, and yet they start 50-50 as according to Fisher's sex ratio logic, therefore you're going to have male-male competition for access to females. Some are going to be good at it, some are not. And you're going to have female choice. And if you're attractive to a few females, you're apt to be more attractive to females in general. Not everyone, of course, but you see, both both male-male competition and female choice are going to increase variance in male reproductive success. So I had I had the whole thing right there then. The rest was trivial. Bateman only applied it to species w with... Uh, where parental investment stopped with the eggs, because that was a simple, obvious argument, and he was dealing with Drosophila. I just said, well, come on now, AJ. Uh, we'll call this thing parental investment, because it varies, and we know in our, our own species that there is often s substantial male parental investment. You know, it's not as great, in my opinion, and it's not as certain. But still, compared to Drosophila, you know, it's built into our species and so on. So we do indeed have uh, female choice and male choice, though female choice happens to be more discriminating, it seems, and better than male choice regarding characteristics related to genetic quality, for example. Um, but never mind that. That's the answer to your question. That's where parental investment came from, was a combination of observations in nature of pigeons where I see myself that this, this similarity to ourselves in terms of, of uh, double standard uh, was easily explained by the difference in the relative cost of a, of a copulation. And that's true in our own case as well, because you can be, um, you know, you can have a boyfriend or a husband or whatnot, but in one wild fling one night, uh, some other male gets paternity. Now, he's, he's got the big bargain, so to speak, which is uh, he's got paternity and no work. And there is a male right there doing the work. Guy that thinks that the child is his. Here's a Senegalese expression I heard the other day that I liked. Better an ugly child that resembles you than a good-looking child that resembles your neighbor. 